Lord, let us have this mentality of the Macedonian church to urgently want to be part of expanding the kingdom of God, Lord. We thank you for the people here, Lord. We, bless, we thank you for blessing them, Lord. Thank you for blessing the church, Lord, and sustaining the church during very difficult times, uh, but keeping the church effective, keeping the church sharp, Lord, and keeping the church uh, continually on the mission. The missio day of the church is to expand the kingdom of God. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's just a good day to be in church. I know a lot of people took off today. I guess it's a nice day to take off, you know. So, uh, shouldn't take off from church, ever. Ever. How's that sound, right? Yeah. Ever. You get in that? You ne never take off from church. God doesn't take off from you, you know? So, take part of the opportunities that you have. Yesterday, we had a tremendous prayer meeting. Uh, you should come out to that. I mean, we had a, a very good time of prayer, uh, and um, it, it's effective time. Uh, I, I did not hand out these to you because I'm not going to hand them out to you because I hand these things out. They cost about 3 or $4 each to make these, uh, and then I find them in the garbage can or people don't use them, but this is a program that I came up with several years ago. It's a very simple program. I was sharing with uh, the, the staff yesterday, uh, or the people at the prayer meeting yesterday. It's 21 days uh, of prayer for family, for our communities, and for our future. And it's based on the book of Daniel, as many of you know, uh, that Daniel had prayed uh, and he had prayed the moment his prayer went up to heaven. It took 21 days to get the response. So I kind of took that and, and kind of made with it 21 days of prayer and reading the Bible. It's a pretty simple program. It's, it's just found on this, on this one little page and it has instructions for it. And basically what you're to do is to uh, every day set aside time for prayer. And it's, it's 21 days. It starts today, I believe, because it's 21 days until Easter. Easter would be the 21st day. So my hope is that each day you wake up or during the course of the day you'll, take, you'll read the Bible, read a portion of the Bible. I would start off reading Daniel chapter 10 every day and read that for 21 days because you'll get something out of it. And it'll encourage you to continue to pray and ask the Lord to uh, hear your prayers and answer your prayers. And then each day you can pray for a different, you can pray for a different person, a different need, or you can pray for the same person for 21 days in a row. I mean, I, I, you know, I may pray for the same person for 21 days in a row. I don't know. I'll see what the Lord leads. But I take this little program and it's got instructions on it, and it, it tells you to read Daniel chapter 10 to encourage you to pray for 21 days, that God will hear your prayer and answer your prayer. And then it shows you the inductive method of Bible study. It's, it's what we do at the, uh, at the graduate level or at school, uh, and it shows you the, inducti the inductive method of studying the Bible, and it, it's broken down for you. It broke it down very simply for you. And, and then what you do is you, you kind of read the instructions, you read the portion of scripture, uh, you read your Bible in the inductive method, and you're, you're learning how to be more of a, a you know, a properly exegete scripture. And then you pray for the person or issue that you have. And you pray for 21 days, and each day you pray, you put who you pray for, and, and, and you can even put like little notes, like your impressions that, you know, I, I, this was a good time of prayer, I prayed for my son, or whatever it may be. And then at the end of 21 days, try not to miss a day. And then at the end of 21 days, you'll have it all filled up on the back, and it's a beautiful exercise to develop prayer in your life and, and Bible reading. And uh, they have them on the side there. Just take it if you're going to use it. If you're not going to use it, leave it for somebody else because, I, you know, these get made at a printer. Uh, and I don't have a lot of them. I gave some to Pastor Lou. Uh, his church wanted to, he wanted to do this with his church. So he's probably announcing it today. And I gave him half of what I had. So uh, uh, it's beautiful. I do this every year. We do this every year here. And I have several of them that are filled up. So uh, take some time out. Uh, look at it. Martin Luther said, prayer is a strong wall and fortress of the church. It is a godly w Christian's weapon. I mean, prayer is, uh, is, is our weapon, right, in the world in which we live. And then Leonard Ravenhill, the father of uh, revival, uh, at least uh, uh, writing about revival, and he was part of revival. So the only reason we don't have revival is because we are willing to live without it. You know, you see what's going on in Kentucky, and they, it, it's too disruptive for their life. You know, it's a disruption to the, to the Christian college that's there and the churches that are there. It's a disruption, right? You know, you know, things, yeah, we have to be disrupted by God, right? We, we want to be interrupted by God. Yes. You know, so, uh, so here it is. It's on the side table there. I encourage you, take it today. Uh, only take it if you're going to do it. Take it, and I'm telling you, it really will transform your life. 21 days of prayer, and if there's something that's really a real need in your life, pray for it for 21 days. You can pray the same thing for 21 days, or you can pray for different people for the 21 days. So uh, spread the love, okay? 
All righty, uh, where are we at? I, I think I started a sermon, or I'm going to end the sermon today, on the, uh, uh, the withered hand. So if you have your uh, bulletin, you can open up your bulletin. And I'm going to read to you uh, the text of uh, what I'll be finishing today. It's uh, not a very long uh, sermon. Uh, hopefully we'll just finish this off, and it's a beautiful ending to this particular sermon. And I was able to... Uh, uh, write and edit uh, 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 really almost an autobiography of the man with a withered hand and I hope uh, it's still in draft form so uh, I hope I can read it properly for you but it's a beautiful summation of what transpired with this beautiful miracle. So the withered hand part 2 Matthew chapter 12 verses 1 to 15 and the healing on the Sabbath goes as this. At the time Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath his disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. He answered, Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that on the Sabbath the priest in the temple desecrate the day and are yet innocent. I tell you that one greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent, for the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He said to them, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched out his hand and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Aware of this, Jesus withdrew from the place. Many followed him. And he healed all their sick, warning them not to tell who he was. So we have this beautiful description of this miracle. And Jesus, as we're going through these particular Sabbath healings, and there's seven of them, we have, I think, three more to do. And each one is interesting. Each one is unique in its own right. And here you have this healing of the withered hand. It's called a, res a restorative a miracle where Jesus restored this hand that was really of, of, of nothing. Have you ever seen anybody with a withered hand? I've seen people with a withered hand, and it's uh, maybe like one quarter the size of their real hand, and it's useless. It's really, it's very ugly. It almost looks like a claw, and I can almost visualize in my mind what this man's hand looked like. It was all shriveled up, and it was all curled up, and it was useless. And uh, it was his right hand, uh, and in all likelihood, he was right-handed. So it was even more the more of, a, of, of a, a disability that he had, and Jesus transformed this man's life. But there wa it wasn't without controversy. Uh, we see here that prior to this miracle, that the disciples, that Jesus and the disciples are going through the grain field, and the disciples, not Jesus, by the way, at least Scripture doesn't say Jesus plucked, but it says the disciples plucked the grain. They were hungry, and while they were walking through a field, they were uh, plucking and eating. And then the Pharisees actually charged them with breaking of the law. Uh, and then Jesus responds to these religious leaders and these Pharisees. I mean, they're really hypocrites, right? I mean, there, there's a lot of hypocrisy in each one of these particular miracles that Jesus performs on, uh, on the Sabbath. And Jesus will confront them during Holy Week. He will confront them uh, very harshly. Uh, not only in the cleansing of the temple, but also on Tuesday. So we'll, we'll talk about more of that uh, during Holy Week. But Jesus then says, wait a minute, you're accusing my disciples of breaking the Sabbath. Uh, and, and Jesus answered them and said, you know, haven't you read? Meaning, he was, he was challenging them. Well, of course he knew that they read the Old Testament, but they may have read the Old Testament. They didn't seem to apply uh, the words of the Old Testament to this situation. And Jesus points this out, the good rabbi that he is. He says, uh, he, Jesus answered uh, the Pharisees after being accused of breaking the Sabbath. Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them, but only for the priests. Certainly, this transaction was a lot less uh, uh, of a violation than that would have been. That was clearly a, a, a bad violation, but rather they were, they were coming back from war and they were hungry. 
Uh, and then Jesus said, or haven't you read in the law, that the priests desecrate the temple because they work all day. And they're working all day in the temple, and they're sinful, as compared to him who is without sin. And he uses the word desecrate, that the priests desecrate the temple. I'm wondering, you know, uh, I'm wondering what Jesus thinks about us pastors all Sunday long all over America. How many of us are desecrating the temple of God? You know, these are tough questions. Theologians ask tough questions, not afraid to ask the tough questions. I mean, but this is what we need to be asking ourselves. I mean, are we much like them that we desecrate the temple on Sundays? I can tell you there's a lot of priests that do and pastors that do. We need to challenge ourselves, and Jesus is challenging them. And then he goes and says this, I tell you that one greater than the temple is here. There was nothing greater than the temple for the religious Jews, for the Pharisees. The temple was everything. It's where God resided. And now Jesus is telling them, one that is, that is greater than the temple is here. He's equating himself to God, that he is God. And he's telling them in so many words. And then he says, and he really summarizes in a way all the Sabbath, that he desires mercy, not sacrifice. And really, mercy is a coded word for love. When you love, you have mercy. When you have no love, you have no mercy. And you can see that throughout history. When there was no love, there was no love in the Third Reich. And there was pure evil. When there's no love for our humanity, for others, brothers and sisters, we, we treat them terribly and do terrible things when there's no love. But when there's love, Jesus desires that mercy, not sacrifice. And Jesus is really giving an ex. Uh, 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 an, an explanation as to what he came for and what his person and work signified. And then he said, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. And then he finds this man with a withered hand and asks the question, is it, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Jesus asked the question, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Well, is a miracle a work? I mean, I guess they could consider that a work. I don't know the Lord would consider a healing a work. And then he questions them again a third time. He says, which one of you would have a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath and not go and pull it out and save its life? And the answer, of course, was that anybody that had a sheep that fell into the pit on the Sabbath would, would go and work and pull it out of the pit to save its life. And then Jesus does the miracle. He says, how much more valuable is man than a sheep? Then he said to the man that was there, stretch out your hand. He stretched out his hand, and it was fully restored. Tremendous miracle. But let me digress a little bit, and I want to share with you something that I found just so interesting about this particular miracle. In your particular version that we have, it, it, it forgets to use a very important word. And if you go back to the, uh, to the King James Version, which it's, it's very difficult to preach out of the King James Version, but if you go back to some of the other translations, you'll find that they use the word behold. And behold is a very important word. Jesus references this man and says, behold. And I was wondering, why is that word so important? Funny thing happened in chapel the other day. We were going over this in chapel. And I had all my notes on, uh, on one of the bulletins uh, for myself, and I must have handed it out uh, during the chapel. And so I was asking uh, just kind of a rhetorical question. I said, of all the words, there's about 250, 300 words in this portion of Scripture that you read from. It's Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 to 15. So there's 15 verses, and you know, say there's 10, uh, you know, 10 words in each verse. There's about 250 words. I haven't counted. But anyway, it was the King James Version. And so I said to the, those participants at the chapel, if you can pick out one word out of the 250 words, what do you think is the most significant word in all that portion of Scripture? What, what's interesting? There's a very interesting, significant word. And I knew nobody was going to get it, but I figured let everybody guess, and maybe somebody would get the, uh, get, get the word right. So you had like a 1 in 250 chance to get the word right. So people are saying different words, and, and nobody, you know, nobody is uh, getting the right word. And then George, one of the fellows, says, I think the most important word is behold. And I looked at him, and I said, George, you stunned me. And being the lawyer that I am, I inquired. 
and I asked him the question, how did you come to choose or select that word? What made you pick that word? And he looked at me and he said, well, I have notes that have the word circled on it. <laughs> Five demerits for you, George. But at least you were honest about it. Because I said, nobody's going to be able to guess that word. Uh, and it was funny, and we looked, and he, he had my notes uh, in the bulletin. So uh, uh, it, was, it was quite fun. It was very funny, and it was very good. But, you know, the, here's the interesting thing about this word, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with, uh, with this uh, thing that was written. Jesus went into their synagogue, and there was a man who had a withered hand. N nothing really overly significant about this. But the interesting thing to me is that when Jesus saw this man and he referenced the man, he said, behold, and he was looking at the man, he was referencing, behold, to this particular poor man with a withered hand. And I began to think to myself, I don't remember him ever saying that to the disciples. It's a very unusual word. And the word means something very special. In, in, in many places, when someone would use the word behold in that time, it was referencing a very special or very educated or very uh, celebrity-like status, behold. But here you have this man with a withered hand that would have been akin to a leper being in the synagogue. See, the world, if they walked into the synagogue and the question were asked, who is the most righteous in all the synagogue? People, we would look around and we would find the person that's dressed in the royal uh, robes and the religious clothing, right? The person that looks the most religious, that appears to be the most religious. And we wouldn't look back at this leper or this man with a withered hand curled up in the corner away from everybody because he's so embarrassed as to the disability that he has. See, but Jesus comes in and that's, he's not fooled by the appearances on the front. He looked to the heart. And he didn't say behold to the religious leaders. He didn't say behold to the Pharisees. He didn't say behold to even his own disciples. But he said behold to him. And it goes to show us something. Behold, although there were some great people in the congregation, in the synagogue, I find no notes of admiration about their presence, no beholds asserted to Peter or Paul or anybody else for that matter. But behold was given to the man with a withered hand. There would be a behold put on the man with a withered hand. Behold means to look at, pay attention to. Behold is a term of great affection, greatness, and special gratitude that Jesus had for the man with the withered hand. Some say that, well, the man with the withered hand should have never been in the synagogue. It was a plant by the Pharisees. Now, we don't know that. Scripture doesn't tell us that. It's certainly a possibility because the man with the withered hand is in the synagogue. He's unclean. He's deformed. And then the Pharisees say to Jesus, you know, is it, is it, uh, you know, is it appropriate to heal on the Sabbath? You know? Is healing okay on the Sabbath? Right? Everyone was there, and they were looking, and then all of a sudden, Jesus says, Behold. And he says, stretch out your hand. And the man is healed. I wonder, this unnamed man with the withered hand, how special he was. How special he was. Let me read to you what I think he wrote to all of you, and I'm going to share this with you. Please bear with me. And then we'll, we'll close. This is a monologue of a, the man with the withered hand. And I think you can apply it to yourself. Another Sabbath, another visit to the synagogue, another day of trying to fellowship with God only to be ignored, rejected by the religious leaders. You see, I'm unclean. I have a deformed hand. It's very unsightly, and people have always treated me differently because of it, treated me like a freak. I've had to cover it up because it scares the children. But it's the adults that seem to have to be repulsed by it more. They treat me like a leper. So I'm in the synagogue, like every other time, every other Sabbath, trying to ignore the comments and the looks, 
when there's a noise, a murmur, a murmur of anticipation. Then suddenly somebody comes in. It's Jesus who walks in the synagogue. I move further into the shadows, further away from him, for fear of embarrassment, of not wanting him to notice me and notice my shriveled hand. I heard he'd been going around healing the multitudes of people, healing all types of sickness, disease, and illness, healing the lepers, healing the blind, raising the dead. But why would he bother with me? Nobody else has ever had. I suddenly noticed that he looked at me, looked straight at me, and somehow looked deep into me, into my heart, my mind, and my soul. And he said to me, Behold, like I was somebody. It's like he knew what I needed. Everyone else looked at me too. But they looked at me differently. The Pharisees, the people. And for a fleeting moment, love flashed across his face toward me. And I saw it. He looked back at me and he smiled. He told me, come over here. I was scared. Why is he calling me? I went toward him. I was thinking, what's going to happen next? And then I began to think, would he heal me? Would he heal me? Then he said to the Pharisees and the teachers, what is lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? To save life or to destroy it? Then he said to me, stretch out your hand. I stretched out my hand and all of a sudden it was healed. It was restored just like my other Everyone looked at me in amazement. And all I could think about is this. Behold. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we are no better than the man with the withered hand. We thank you for these beautiful miracles, Lord, and the display of your majesty, the display of your greatness, O oh God. Let it begin with us, O oh Lord. Restore us, Lord, whether that be physically or whether it be spiritually. We thank you for all that you're doing in Jesus' precious name and all the people.